Let's discuss why someone would need an anterior cervical fusion over a disc replacement. I see a lot of patients for second opinions for degenerative disc disease in their spine. Let's go through the differences between the two and why one may be preferred over another. Yesterday I presented the case of a 52 year old man who comes to my office complaining of neck pain, headaches, and a popping sensation in his neck for many years. This is a CT scan of a cervical spine and what we see on this CT is degenerative disc disease or bone on bone pathology at C6 and C7 and C5 and C6 where you can see that the disc material is no longer there if you compare it to the height of the disc at these other levels like up here. What's also really important to notice in this case is this patient complained of trouble with balance, fine motor tasks such as buttoning his shirt or opening jars and falls and his MRI showed spinal cord compression. Let's talk about what that is. When we look at an MRI of the cervical spine in this view, we're actually looking at a patient from the side of their neck like this. So the front of their neck is here and the back of their neck is here. And right here is the spine. This gray thing right here is actually the spinal cord as it comes through the spinal canal. And it's normal to see this gray material here, which is the cord itself, and the white is the fluid that surrounds the spinal cord. And we see right here and right here, the spinal cord is very compressed. Spinal cord compression could lead to signs of cervical myelopathy, which our patient had, which included trouble with his balance, difficulty walking with falls, and trouble with fine motor tasks. That means in cases of spinal cord compression that is symptomatic, like our patient, we do not refer the patient for conservative treatment options like physical therapy or medication management or even injection because the symptoms can progress and can even lead to paralysis. Almost always symptomatic cervical myelopathy is a surgically treated disease. Notice there were several comments in the comment section that mentioned that this patient should go get their neck manipulated by a chiropractor. Any patient with signs and symptoms of spinal cord compression should never have their neck manipulated. Now, why did I make it such a big deal about his neck popping and cracking? What is that? Popping and cracking of any joint is typically when air is released from a joint. Just like popping or cracking our fingers, you can also pop and crack joints in your neck called the facet joints, which are the joints that lay in the back part of the spine. And at each level of our cervical spine, there are two facets. That means in our cervical spine or in our neck, there are 12 different joints that can pop. Now, popping your neck isn't something that you should really be concerned about because it can be somewhat normal. I don't know about you guys, but I'm in my 40s and when I climb upstairs, sometimes I get popping in my knees. Here's a cartoon depiction of what I am talking about in the neck. And here you see two bones in the cervical spine with the interlying disc space and the joint is called the facet joint, which is located on the back part of our neck. So things that could cause pain in our neck are degenerative disc disease where our discs wear out, as well as facet joint arthritis or arthritis in the back part of our joints. If you look at our facet joints on a cross-section CT examination of our neck, this is what they should look like. And I tell patients that they kind of look like little hamburgers. If you start to develop arthritis in your facets, it can look on CT scan, like here showing a bone spur coming out of the facet an overgrown facet like in this picture right here, or even severe arthritis in your facets like in this picture. And I can pretty much guarantee you that that patient's neck is popping and cracking. The fact that the neck hurts with associated popping and cracking can be a sign of facet arthritis. I also mentioned that this patient had pain in his scapular region, and I wanted to point out this diagram that I love to use for referral patterns secondary to facet arthritis. If you have bad arthritis in a particular joint in your cervical spine, it can send referred pain to these different parts of the back part of your neck. And because this patient had pathology at all of these levels, his pain did seem to localize right here in the scapula, which would indicate a problem at C4-5, C5-6, or C6 and 7. Let's get back into the topic of how we should treat our patients surgically, and I have three main reasons as to why this patient is not a candidate for disc replacement. Severe facet arthritis is a contraindication for disc replacement, and this is a picture of our patient's facets showing significant degeneration and arthritis in those facet joints. I really like this model when we talk about how the spine moves. These are the bones in our spine, our disc, and then back here are those facet joints. 
So when we flex and extend our neck, you can see how those joints move. If these joints have arthritis, it's gonna cause pain. So if the patient has severe arthritis in the disc and in the joints, but we only replace the disc, the patient will still have pain because their painful joints still move. And that's why our patient isn't a candidate for disc replacement. Contraindication number one for disc replacement is facet arthritis. Reason number two is his MRI findings. I mentioned in the physical examination during the presentation that he has hyperreflexia, positive Babinski, and Hoffman signs. Those are all clinical examination findings that we perform on a patient that will tell us that their spinal cord is compressed. Some people are really proud when they have good reflexes, but I can tell you that sometimes good reflexes are a bad thing. Hoffman sign is another sign that we use to check for cervical myelopathy, and it's where we can take the patient's hand, flick the tip of their finger, and if their whole hand claws in like that, that is a sign of spinal cord compression. On this patient's MRI, what we see is that there is severe cord compression at C5-6 and C4 and C5, and I also showed that on the patient's axial images. But the amount of bone that we would have to remove in this patient to get adequate spinal cord decompression, this would also lead him to not be a candidate for disc replacement. And the last reason is that this patient needs three levels treated in my opinion. The first level is C6 and C7 because there is barely any disc material left. And of course, the two regions where the spinal cord is compressed will also have to be treated. Cervical disc replacements are only FDA indicated in one to two levels. Now that's not to mean that you cannot perform this disc replacement at more than two levels. It's just almost impossible to get approved by insurance. And of course, it's off-label and not tested. Given the findings of severe spinal cord compression, his neurological examination, MRI findings, and CT findings, I recommended that this patient have a three-level anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Let's talk about how we do that procedure. To perform an anterior cervical discectomy infusion, we make an incision on the front part of the patient's neck. We then carefully reflect the vital structures to the side, including the carotid artery and the esophagus. This allows us to access the patient's spine where we can safely remove the disc and remove any bone spurs that are compressing the nerves or the spinal cord. That disc is then replaced with a cage and a plate and screws is applied. In my hands, this patient underwent a C4 to C7 anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Here are his post-operative x-rays and he did excellent after the surgery. The two hour operation, he spent one night in the hospital and went home the following day. Over the next three to six months, all of his symptoms improved, including his neck pain, headaches, and most importantly, his weakness and trouble with his walking. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.